nice guys and ugly guys. Many people treat the Israeli-Palestinian tragedy as a clash between right and wrong, as a Hollywood movie. Essentially, it is not. It is a tragic clash between right and right. Sometimes it's a clash between wrong and wrong. Often it is a clash between wrong and wrong. But black and white it is not. The fanatics on all sides are trying to paint it in black and white. Now, the fanat fanatic is also fascinated by death, attracted to death and charmed by death. The fanatic is not a person who would willingly sacrifice his life for a cause, no. The fanatic is a person looking for a cause for which he or she will sacrifice their lives. Because life is insignificant, because life is empty, because life is hollow, because life is meaningless outside the cause, because, as I said, the fanatic is 100% public. It's very important to be public. It's very important to be publicly involved. It's very important for every decent human being to be public. But please, for God's sake, not 100% public. 30% is enough. Give or take. Israel is a f spatial fascination from fanatics all over the world, possibly because it was born out of a dream. And the magnitude of a dream created unrealistic expectations from Israel. Israel is expected to achieve world record in high jump morality. It is expected by some people to be the most Christian nation in the world, if not the only Christian nation in the world, in terms of turning its other cheek to an enemy. It is expected to perform a universal role model in morality. It cannot live up to those expectations, not in a state of everlasting conflict. Unfortunately, Israel, Israel's moral standard in its conflict with the Arabs, with the Palestinians, is sinking lower and lower. But certainly, these are not the world record in morality. Fanatics are quick to jump on Israel. If Israel is not a sample state. If Israel is not a light unto the nation, let there be no Israel. Very soon, in a few weeks, the Durban Convention will reconvene again, and we will hear the usual anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli talk, which goes way beyond the legitimate criticism of Israel, and Israel deserves a lot of legitimate criticism for its rigid position on the Palestinian issue and on the settlements. But the Durban conference is going always, or for several times now, going way beyond legitimate criticism. It is a festival of hatred. It is a festival of fanaticism, of anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist, and indeed anti-Jewish fanaticism. Now, the fanatic is also a great sentimentalist. A friend of mine, the Israeli novelist Sami Michael, told me an episode. He was driven once for a lecture at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, in my university. He was driven from Haifa, which is a long drive, three hours, by a very militant, right-wing, fanatical taxi driver. And during the, driver, the drive, the chauffeur says to Sami, you know, I believe we have to kill all the Arabs. As simple as that. Sami is a sophisticated man. Instead of saying, shame on you, or instead of just wrapping himself in silence, he turned to the chauffeur and said, yes, you think so, and who exactly do you think should kill all the Arabs? We should kill them. All of us have to kill them. No, be more specific, please. Should the police kill them? Should the army kill them? Should the doctors kill them? Who should kill all the Arabs? Quiet. The chauffeur is thinking. Then the chauffeur is saying, I think every one of us has to kill a few. <laughs> Sami doesn't lose his temper. He never loses his temper. He says to the chauffeur, OK, suppose you are allocated one block of flats, one block of apartments in Haifa, your hometown, and you are to kill all the Arabs in the block. And you knock on every door or ring every doorbell, excuse me, sir, excuse me, madam, are you an Arab? 
And if the answer is yes, you shoot them and kill them. And you finish the block and you turn to walk home and then you hear a baby crying from upstairs. Would you go back upstairs and kill the baby, yes or not? Silence, the chauffeur is thinking. Then the chauffeur turns to Sami saying, sir, you are a very cruel man. This is a significant story because the fanatic has no imagination. All fanatics have no imagination. They don't have the ability to put themselves in other people's shoes. I'm a great believer in curiosity. I think curiosity is an antidote to fanaticism. I think curiosity is a powerful antidote to fanaticism. I think curious people are in the habit of putting themselves under the skins, or at least in the shoes of other people, imagining the other. What if I were him? What if I were her? This is a powerful antidote. I believe a curious person is a better person than a pu person who is not curious. I believe curiosity is a moral imperative. I even believe a curious person is a better lover than a person who is not curious, but it's too Ill early in the evening to discuss this aspect. So curiosity is an antidote. Humor is another antidote. I have never met a fanatic with a sense of humor, <laughs> nor have I ever met a person with a sense of humor becoming a fanatic unless he or she lost their sense of humor, which happens sometimes. Because humor is relativity. Humor is the ability to see yourself as others see you. Humor is very often the ability to contain more than one valid point of view of a certain situation. So if I could only compress sense of humor into capsules and persuade entire populations to swallow my humor capsules, thus immune them to fanaticism, I may qualify one day for a Nobel Prize in medicine, not in literature. <laughs> but then look at me, look what am I doing. I am fantasizing about compressing sense of humor into capsules make other people swallow my humor capsules for their own good, changing them for their own good. It's very easy, it's very catchy. You can easily become, become an anti-fanatic fanatic, an anti-militant militant. Very dangerous, be careful. Now, it always begins inside the family. The grain, the seed of fanaticism is inside the family. You, spouse, or child, or brother, or sister, you must change for your own good. You must be like me, you must become like me. I want to change you. Otherwise, this marriage is not going to work. Either you are going to change or this marriage is not going to work. Either you are going to change or I don't like you anymore. Either you are going to change or everything is going to end very badly. When this urge to change the other becomes violent and uncompromising, this is the seed of fanaticism. And this happens in every family. It happens in the best of families. Where have we not held the sentence, you must change, please change, for your own good, of course, always for your own good. The fanatic is always interested in your own good. He's always falling on your neck, loving you, wanting to save you and to cure you and to rescue you. In case you prove to be incurable, he will be at your throat. He will kill you also for your own good. And finally, not only curiosity and humor and the ability to imagine the other are antidotes to fanaticism. Another powerful antidote is the ability to live in open-ended situations. To accept the fact that some conflicts are not resolvable. That some conflicts don't resolve, they dissolve into fatigue and exhaustion. And this will be my only touch on the Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab conflict. It's not going to be resolved through a magic formula after which the two parties will embrace one another like long lost brothers in tears. Oh brothers, will you ever forgive me? Please love me, take the land. Who cares about the land? Give me your love. This is never going to happen. What is likely to happen 
and what is perhaps beginning to happen in the Middle East is a syndrome of fatigue and exhaustion both among Israelis and Palestinians. And a syndrome of fatigue and exhaustion finally leads to a compromise. I know the word compromise is regarded as an ugly word, as a dirty word, especially to some young idealists. They think compromise is dishonest. They think compromise is lack of integrity. They think compromise is somehow sneaky. Not in my vocabulary. In my vocabulary, the word compromise is synonymous with the word life. And where there is life, there ought to be compromises. And the opposite of compromise is not integrity. And the opposite of compromise is not idealism. The opposite of compromise is fanaticism and death. I'm a great believer in compromise as opposed to capitulation. I'm not advocating turning the other cheek to an enemy. I'm advocating trying to meet the other somewhere halfway. And believe me, I know one or two things about compromises, having been married to the same woman for 51 years. <laughs> so the Israelis and the Palestinians are tired. And it is a blessed fatigue. It's not that the eyes of the Palestinians are open to see the light of the Zionist truth, or the eyes of the Israelis open to see the light of the genuine claim of the Palestinians over the land. None of that. It's a clenched teeth acceptance that we are not alone in the land. We Israelis are not alone in the land. The Palestinians are not alone in the land. No one is going to go out. And this small country, smaller than Denmark, make so much fuss about it, you, th you would think it's bigger than China. But in fact, it's smaller than Denmark. This small country happens to be the only home of two nations. They cannot become one happy family because they are not one and because they are not happy and because they are not even family. They are two unhappy families. They have to divide the house into two smaller apartments. I think this is called in English a semi-detached home. <laughs> This is likely to happen. The only ones who oppose it and object it and try to derail it are the fanatics on both sides. The, <laughs> the advocates of greater Palestine and the advocates of greater Israel, they would not compromise. They want it all for themselves. They ignore the existence of the other. Now, this is a natural definition of the fanatical evil, ignoring the existence of the other, or ignoring the essence of the other, or ignoring the respect of the other. I'm a great believer in compromises. Even the, and this will be my concluding remark, even the controversial issue of the holy places in Jerusalem can be resolved through a pragmatic compromise. Whose holy places? This seems to be irresolvable, unsolvable. But I have my grandmother's wisdom. She was a wise old man, and I, when I was a little boy, she explained to me in simple words, where is the difference between Jew and Christian? Not between Jew and Muslim, but between Jew and Christian. And she said the following. She said, you see, my boy, the Christians believe that the Messiah have been here once, and he will come again one day. We Jews believe that the Messiah is still to come. Over this difference, you cannot imagine, she said, how much hatred and bloodshed and persecution, why, she said, why can't everybody simply wait and see? If the Messiah comes saying, hello, it's nice to see you again, the Jews will have to apologize to the Christians. If, on the other hand, the Messiah comes saying, how do you do, it's good to meet you, the entire Christian world will have to apologize to the Jews. Until then, said my grandmother, live and let live. And let this line be the bottom line of my presentation. Live and let live. Thank you very much. Thank you.